We welcome all of you to our Tuesday evening Bible study. We're going to begin a new series of teachings from today. 30 years ago, exactly in 1992, I began a series on the epistle to the Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, and went on for seven and a half years to teach Romans basically verse to verse. And uh, Romans is such an important part of the Bible, perhaps the most important epistle and uh, the greatest presentation of the Christian doctrine of salvation. And therefore, it is very necessary for the Christian church to understand the epistle to the Romans well. So we did this back then in 30 years ago. And at that time, it was quite unfortunate that we could not uh, videotape it because we were not using video cameras at that time. And uh, our equipments were of far inferior quality and the quality of recordings were not that good. And also 30 years have passed by. I think we can do a lot better job now with a lot more experience. I think we can cover these doctrines even better for the benefit of the people. And uh, since it's been 30 years, I thought I must, in my lifetime, preach and record this for the people of God in this church and everywhere so that people can benefit from it for a long time to come. So that's why I decided to do the book of Romans again. It's a very important book, and I think uh, it's worth doing it again. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a long time. But I'm going to try to do it and try to complete it. So we begin today, the book of Romans, and every time I preach on Tuesday nights, when my turn comes to preach on Tuesday nights, we will do this. And in that way, we'll continue this for a long time to come. Please turn with me to the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Romans, chapter one. And let me read to you just the first verse, because we're gonna talk just about the first verse. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Now, when you look at an epistle like this, you begin to, at the outset, realize certain things. You realize that this is the first epistle in the order in which the books are presented to us in the New Testament. This is the first among epistles. Now, why did the church decide to put this epistle as the first one among all the epistles? Because in this we find all the foundational truths of the scriptures. So after giving us the story of the church in the book of Acts, the book of Acts contains the history of the church for the first 35 years. That's the only church history we have in the Bible of the first 35 years, what happened, how the church was established, how the gospel spread everywhere that is presented to us in the book of Acts. Right after giving the story of how the church was founded, this epistle was put as the first epistle. And the history of the church tells us that this book of Romans has played a more important and more crucial part in the history of the church than any other book in the entire Bible, really. We must study the whole Bible. The whole Bible is important, but the history of the church tells us that this book has played more important part and crucial part of the church than any other book. For example, some of the things achieved through this particular book in the history of the church are these. Let me list some of them. The conversion of a man named St. Augustine, a very towering figure in the first few centuries of the Christian church. He lived in the fourth and the fifth centuries. And his background was that, that he was a brilliant man, but he lived a very immoral life. So that by the time he was 19, they say that he had an illegitimate child through a relationship with a woman and he was having relationship with all kinds of people. He was given to lust, and that was a main problem in his life. 
and he lived a life of sin, in other words. And uh, at one point in his life, he became interested in the gospel and started hearing some truths preached by some great preachers. And uh, something was happening in his heart. The Holy Spirit was working in his heart. And one day, he went and sat in a garden, really in agony of soul. In his soul, he felt a restlessness and an agony. And he heard a child saying, rise and read. Those words in Latin, rise and read. And he got up and started, went into his room and started reading from Romans 13. And the portion that he read is the last few verses to which his eyes fell. And he started reading from verse 12 of 13th chapter. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. What a passage to read for a man who was given to lust, who was always making provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, who was always living in this way, in lewdness and lust, and uh, living a, a life of sin. What a passage to point to. And uh, amazing that after he read this passage, something happened to him and he got converted. And later he became well known as Saint Augustine. He is probably the most popular preacher of the time. And uh, he has done a lot of good to the church by his teachings. A lot of the teachings that we have today, such as the doctrine of original sin and so on, were taught very clearly by him back then in the fourth and fifth century. Now, another thing that happened in history is how St. Augustine handled the Pelagian heresy, what is called the Pelagian heresy. What is the Pelagian heresy? There was a British monk named Pelagius who lived between 354 AD and 420 AD, pretty much the same time that St. Augustine lived. And uh, he had some views on human depravity, the doctrine of human depravity. The doctrine of human depravity had to do with the effect of sin upon humanity. To what extent did sin affect humanity? So he came up with some views concerning the effect of sin on humanity. What is the heresy that he came up with? What is the wrong teaching that he came up with? He said that human beings are born innocent. Eh? But the Bible teaches us that they are not born innocent, they are born in sin. But he said that they were born innocent and therefore they have an inherent capacity to obey God. People can obey God. And that was the first heresy that he started with, that people are born innocent, therefore they can obey God. Then he said, there is no legal or actual guilt. You know, the Bible teaches there is a legal guilt that the humanity bears. Adam's sin, as a representative man, as the first man, became the sin of entire humanity. So the Bible says, in Adam we all sinned. And in Christ we all become righteous. That's the way the Bible teaches it. But uh, this man taught, Pelagius taught, that there is no legal guilt. Humanity did not bear the sin of Adam. There is no legal guilt. And there is no actual guilt. <laughs> And we did not sin in Adam, but we only sinned like Adam. Eh? These are things that are totally against the scriptures. The Bible says we sinned in Adam. We were all in Adam. We sinned in Adam. Through one man, sin entered into the whole world. From generation to generation, sin is inherited, the Bible teaches. But Pelagius taught that what we inherited from Adam is only a bad example. 
not a sin nature, but a bad example from Adam. No propensity to sin, no necessity to die. We only inherited a bad example because we just follow the way of Adam as a bad example. Did not inherit sin nature, he said. And uh, not only that, he believed that only our sin is imputed to us, not Adam's sin. And uh, the spiritual image of God, now this is very important, that the spiritual image of God is retained in man after the fall, not erased or not effaced. The Bible, I believe, teaches that the image and likeness of God, which God gave to man, was effaced, not erased, but effaced. But he believed, no, it is not effaced, it is retained even after the fall. And therefore, grace is not necessary at all. Grace can have no effect. Why does man need God's grace at salvation? Grace is not needed. Man can simply come to God, obey God. He has the ability to do right. Therefore, he doesn't need God's grace enabling him to come to salvation. Now, this is a terrible error. And if it was allowed to continue, it would have destroyed the church. And Augustine, St. Augustine, is the main person who rose up and fought against this Pelagian heresy by presenting the truth that is there in the Romans. The book of Romans deals with all these things. The book of Romans tells us that we were all in Adam, we sinned in Adam, we carry a guilt because of Adam's sin, a legal guilt, an actual guilt, because not only did Adam sin and made us all sinners, we also sinned, so we have actual guilt also. We didn't inherit a bad example we inherited sin nature itself from Adam. And the spiritual image of God in man is effaced. It is not retained. These are things that is taught very clearly in the book of Romans. Using mainly the book of Romans, St. Augustine fought against the Pelagian heresy until it was condemned in the fifth century in a council that gathered it was publicly condemned and put away. Thirdly, look at Martin Luther and the Reformation. You know, Martin Luther and the Reformation. I've given a talk on Martin Luther and the Reformation in the 500th year uh, of the Reformation in the Lutheran Church. Uh, you may want to hear it. It's a, quite a long talk, about one and a half hours, but it covers the entire work of Martin Luther and how he brought about the Reformation and so on. It will be helpful to you, but the only thing is it's in Tamil and uh, it is available on YouTube. Now, if you look at Martin Luther and the Reformation, you'll realize that Romans is the crucial document or was the crucial document that led to the Protestant Reformation through Martin Luther. Martin Luther in 1515 AD, decided to give lectures to his students on Romans. Therefore, he started studying Romans very seriously. And as a result of his studies, in the very first chapter all itself, he recognized this revelation that the just shall live by faith. He began to understand it. You know, he was always struggling with the assurance of salvation. He never felt satisfied that he's accepted by God. Actually, he went and complained to one of the elderly priests saying, how can I bring the righteousness that God expects? God says, my righteousness is filthy rags. No matter how good I can live, no matter what best I can do, it is only filthy rags before God, he says. How can I bring the kind of righteousness that God requires? He wants a righteousness that is equal to his righteousness, that is he only will accept his righteousness. How can I have the righteousness like God? It's impossible for me. How come God is so cruel? That was his question to the elderly priest. How can God be so cruel to require from man what he cannot give? How can I come up with the righteousness that God expects? A righteousness that is divine. 
And this was always a question and there was always a struggle for assurance of salvation. And as he was studying the book of Romans, he began to see the answer to that question. He began to see that since no human being can come up with a righteousness that God can accept, God has decided that he will send his son and put him on the cross and put all our sin upon him and take his righteousness, the righteousness of the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, and give it to us. There was a big exchange that happened on the cross. And that is what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So he became sin, we became righteousness, not with our righteousness, but with his righteousness. Our sin became his, so that he became sin. His righteousness became ours, so that we became righteous, acceptable before God. Now this is what brought about the Protestant Reformation, and that's from chapter 1 of Romans and verse 17. John Bunyan's conversion is another thing that happened as a result of the book of Romans. Along with uh, Galatians, John Bunyan began to read Luther's commentary on Romans and Galatians. And it is these scriptures that brought him to Christ and brought about his conversion. John Wesley's conversion in London was as a result of the book of Romans. He had earlier come to America as a missionary and uh, He experienced great failure. But in his journey, he met some Moravian brothers. And these Moravian brothers knew what Martin Luther had taught. They knew justification by faith and shared with him the truth. He understood it mentally, but did not witness to it in his heart. He did not feel anything. He did not really believe and and be saved at that time. He heard it and it touched his mind. He was stimulated in his mind to think along those lines. But then when he returned to England in total failure, could not get the job done at all, could not get his missionary work going in America, became a failure, went back to England. And he attended a prayer meeting in London. And in that, a man was reading from the commentary that Martin Luther had written on the book of Romans. And he was not even reading the commentary. He read the introduction to the commentary. And just listening to the introduction to the commentary on Romans written by Martin Luther, he says his heart was warmed at that moment. Something happened in his heart. The Holy Spirit worked in his heart. And that led to his conversion. And he received a mighty assurance of salvation that day. And it turned this man who was a failure as a preacher to a man who shook the whole world, literally. Then another instance is a revival in Europe that happened as a result of the work of Robert Haldane. He's an Englishman, he's a Scottish man, I think, and he was in Switzerland, sitting somewhere in a park, and he happened to overhear two young people who happened to be theological students uh, somewhere in Switzerland, sitting there and talking about theological matters. And uh, when he overheard them, he realized how ignorant they were concerning scriptures and how ignorant they were concerning truth. This man, Robert Haldane, knew the truth about justification by faith and how a person is saved and so on. He knew what Martin Luther taught. And he realized that these young people didn't know anything. So he kind of began to talk to them and invited them to a Bible study that he was organizing. And they came and found it so interesting, they went and got a whole lot of others to attend the Bible study. So a lot of young people came and attended, a lot of brilliant young people of that time who were studying theology and so on. They attended the Bible study. And some of them became very famous people later on. One of them wrote the greatest book on Protestant history, Another one wrote a very famous work on the inspiration of scripture. So Robert Robert Haldane's work in teaching the book of Romans in that Bible study to explain 
the Christian doctrine really accomplished a great deal in that day and brought about a great revival in Christianity. There are instances where great men of God have shown how much they liked the book of Romans and how much they appreciated the book of Romans. There are some great testimonies to this effect. One is from John Chrysostom. They say John Chrysostom had the book of Romans read to him twice a week because he felt it was incomparable book. Martin Luther said that this is the chief part of the New Testament. This is the main or the greatest part of the New Testament. It contained the purest gospel. He believed that a Christian not only should know it word by word, uh, he believed that the more you handled it, the more you worked on understanding it, the better it tastes. He loved the book of Romans. There was a man named Coleridge who was a poet, a man of literature who not only knew English very well but German and very knowledgeable in the area of literature. He said that the book of Romans or the epistle to the Romans is the profoundest piece of writing in existence. Have we realized how profound the book of Romans is as a Christian? If you don't know how profound the book of Romans is, I invite you to come and listen and continue to listen to the teaching on the book of Romans. And I think God will do some great work in a lot of us today as we once again teach the book of Romans. Now, let's go look at this text itself. The text that we read is Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and it begins in English language with the word Paul. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So it begins with the word Paul. That's the first word. It is written by a man called Paul. He's writing to the Christians in Rome, the majority of whom were Gentiles. And what an astonishing thing it is to think that a man such as Paul, with his background as a Jew and a Pharisee, should be writing to a church which is mainly Gentile. That is why it is astonishing. Because he was raised as a rigid, rabid, nationalistic Jew. He hated Christ and everything connected with Christ. He was trying to exterminate the Christian church. He was trying to put the preachers behind the bars and shut down churches. And while he was trying to do that, he met the risen Lord. And you know the story of how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. As a result, his whole life changed. And then he became the mighty defender of the Christian faith. The very faith that he hated and tried to exterminate, he tried to propagate. And he took it all over the world. It's amazing how this man is now writing to the Gentile church. He was such a nationalistic Jew, a rigid Jew, a Pharisee, but now sees the gospel as something that belongs to the whole world, to every creature, and therefore writing to a church which is mainly Gentiles. All right. Now, God had called this man to be an apostle, separated this man to the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, he says that in his mother's womb, God marked him and separated him for the work of the gospel. God had two great tasks for him to carry out. One is that he, in the future, must be the person who will defend Christianity against the attacks of Judaism. That Judaism will try to come against Christianity in every way possible to destroy it, but he must be the defender. That's one task that he must do because that is why God has chosen him and that's why all the background training and preparation was given to him in that way. The second reason our second task that God had for him was that he must become an apostle to the Gentiles. So two tasks 
for which God had marked him, chosen him, separated him and called him. One is to be the defender of the gospel, defender of the Christian faith against the attacks of Judaism. And the other is to be an apostle to the Gentiles to take the gospel everywhere throughout the whole world. Now, in order to do these two tasks, it's amazing how God prepared this man. Now, I want you to see the glory of God through all of this. On Sunday mornings, we are hearing preaching on when we read the Bible, we must see the glory of God. You know, the Bible is there to show us how great God is, you know, how truly great he is, how wonderful he is. And here, in the very first verse itself, where it refers to Paul, the author of the book of Romans, we see the glory of God in the preparation of this man for the work for which God has chosen him. In order to do those two tasks, to be the defender of the Christian faith against Judaism, and to be the propagator of the gospel among Gentiles. God prepares him from his mother's womb. Let me show you how. The first preparation that God does is that he endows him with unusual and exceptional natural ability, intellectual ability. Now, intellectual abilities don't happen on the way. It must happen from your mother's womb. The brain must be wired to be so intelligent, so brilliant, so that one day the child will grow up, will become one of the greatest intellectuals, and which Paul did. They say that at the end of the Second World War, there was a series of lectures organized in the city of London on the masterminds of the ages. And it was not organized by Christians, it was organized by secular people, non-Christians. They were going to talk about the great masterminds of the ages. And lo and behold, among the great masterminds of the ages is listed this Paul, the preacher of the gospel. The secular world thought that he was the mastermind of the ages. He was one of the masterminds of the ages. Great intellectual, great thinker, and one of the greatest intellectuals, not just in the church, but in the world in general. So this is something that God wired his brain and made him so intelligent, so talented, so gifted, gave him some natural ability to think and analyze. And uh, he had tremendous power of reasoning. And uh, his logic is amazing. His arguments and the way he gathers evidence and the way he presents them in a compelling manner is amazing, and you will see all of that as we study the book of Romans. You will see his brilliance, his thinking, his logic, his arguments, and how tight his presentation is of those arguments. Nobody could defend the Christian faith against Judaism and against anything else than this brilliant man, Paul. He was given a brain, he was given an intellectual ability to do that very effectively. God has begun to work on him even from the mother's womb as he was formed in his mother's womb. That is why he says, God chose me and separated me to the gospel from my mother's womb. The work of God starts in us. As we are in our mother's womb, God wires us in a certain way for the task ahead, for the calling with which God has called us, for the purpose for which we are born in this world. God begins to wire us. God begins to make us with natural gifts and abilities that will enable to accomplish God's purposes. And that happened to Paul. He was made as a brilliant thinker. And secondly, his birth as a Jew. God had him born as a Jew. That's why he says in Philippians chapter 3, talking about his Jewish heritage, he says that he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, trained as a Pharisee. He had the privilege of learning from the greatest of the Pharisee of the time, Gamaliel. That's like going to the best university uh, of that day. All of this background, being born in a Jewish home, trained as a Pharisee, trained under the greatest Pharisee, Gamaliel, all of this happened by God's guidance and God's 
direction. God was leading him and guiding him even before he knew Christ. So that God had him trained as a great expert in the Jewish understanding and interpretation of the law of God. So that later on, when he defends Christianity, when the issue of law and grace and all of those things come up, he is able to defend the church against the onslaught of Judaism. And he was able to interpret the law correctly and he was able to argue against anybody that came against the church and against the teaching of grace as against the law. All right. He was also a Roman citizen. And that is also something that God had ordered. In chapter 22 of the book of Acts, remember he goes into Jerusalem, into the temple, and there's a big mob that comes to beat him up, and a Roman commander comes and gets him and leads him to safety. And then the commander asks him, tell me, are you Roman? In verse 27. And Paul says, yes. And the commander answered, with a large sum I obtained the citizenship. Roman citizenship couldn't be obtained back in those days in so many different ways. One of the ways is that you can pay for it, large sums of money. Even today, citizenship is available for large sums of money in many countries. So that man says, I paid a large sum of money and obtained my citizenship. Paul said to him, but I was born a citizen. So he was quite a privileged person. He's not a person who bought citizenship. He was born as a Roman citizen, and he uses it to his advantage in so many places. More than once, he uses it to his advantage. Do you remember in one place, they arrest him, and they actually beat him, and tie him up hands and legs and throw him in prison. And then he says, look, I'm a Roman citizen. How can you beat a Roman citizen? Because a Roman citizen cannot be beaten without court ordering it as a punishment. Only when the court says this many lashes can be given as a punishment can a Roman citizen be beaten. You cannot simply take him to the police station and beat him. Roman citizens were privileged in that way. They were entitled to certain rights and privileges like that. So he began to question them. And as soon as they realized that he was a Roman citizen, they set him loose and told him to go, and he refused to go. He said, call your magistrate, call everybody. How can they do this to me? So you can see that his Roman citizenship helped him carry the gospel everywhere and protected him from assault, protected him in so many ways as he took the gospel everywhere throughout the world. He was in a privileged position. He was a Roman citizen, and therefore he had certain rights and privileges, and he used it to the utmost. And God ordered this thing in his life, that he was a free Roman citizen. That is also important. You know, not only a born citizen, but he was a free man. In those days, the society was divided into two categories, basically, the free and the slave. And he says he's a free man. A man who's born a Roman citizen, who's a free man, is the most privileged person. And God had given him that status. Thirdly, he was brought up in a place called Tarsus. And Tarsus is known for its Greek culture. Athens and Alexandria are the two great cities that are well known for Greek culture. But Tarsus is not behind those two cities. It's equal to those cities in Greek culture. They are main centers of Greek culture. And Tarsus was one of those places. And he knew the Greek culture. He knew the Greek poets and philosophers and could quote them as he preached. Remember, in Athens, he preaches. And there, people are into the Greek culture. And he preaches there, and he quotes the Greek philosophers and poets and so on. So, Greek culture, Roman citizenship, Jewish heritage, exceptional natural abilities. Look at his background. Look at how God builds him as an instrument in his hands how God purposefully goes about directing his life even before he came to know Christ. God was at his work in his life. From the time he was being formed in his mother's womb, God had already started wiring him in a certain way. 
preparing him in a certain way throughout his life, led him with a certain kind of training, certain kind of cultural background, and so on, so that he can take the gospel everywhere. Because he had Greek culture built into him, because he was raised in that. Here we have a Christian preacher who not only understood the gospel very well, because he's from the Jewish background, understood the Old Testament scriptures, understood the gospel so well, because the Jews in general were well prepared to receive the gospel. He also knew the Greek culture. He knew the people well, the people to whom he was preaching. Wherever he went, he realized, you know, what kind of people they are and what their culture is, and he was able to appeal to them in a great way. So he was able to carry out those two tasks effectively, the defense of the faith against Judaism. Remember one instance where an Antioch Peter comes to visit and Antioch church had a lot of Gentiles and they're sitting and eating together, which they're not supposed, the Jews were not supposed to do. They don't sit and eat with the Gentiles and they were all sitting and eating with the Gentiles because it's a Christian church. Now there's no Greek nor Jew. <laughs> so they're sitting and eating together and all of a sudden another group from Jerusalem comes, a Jewish group. And immediately Peter gets up does not want to be identified with the Gentiles. Wants to look like he's clean, you know, that he doesn't sit and eat with Gentiles. And Paul rebukes him, you know, tells him that he being a Jew is behaving like a Gentile now. How can you do that, he says. So here is Paul, a man who was so immersed in the Jewish doctrines, man who believed all the things that Peter and others believed. And he believed it even more than they did. Now able to speak against it authoritatively. He could speak against the circumcision and, and boldly say that circumcision is not necessary. You know, he went all the way to Jerusalem and took his case and made his case and won the case with the apostles and came. You know, so that circumcision was not a requirement among the Gentiles when they preached and preached the gospel because the Jewish people at that time who became Christians were requiring the Gentiles to get circumcised also. They were bringing in Judaism and mixing it with Christianity and Paul was against it and he could battle it very effectively. The book of Galatians deals with it so effectively, doctrinally he deals with it because he's equipped to do that. One of the things that Paul was able to do was he was able to reconcile the Old Testament with the New Testament. Remember, as soon as he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he went into Arabia for a long period of time. Just disappeared into Arabia. What did he do in Arabia? When I talked about the story of Paul just a year ago, I taught this. Went into Arabia and I kind of know what he must have done. He has studied the Old Testament thoroughly before he never saw Christ in it. He looked at, he had a perspective that the Pharisees had taught him. But now he sees Christ in it. He goes and researches. He goes and reads it all over again. And now in Arabia, looking at the scriptures that he has always learned and became an expert at, now he reads it all over again. And in every page, he can see Jesus in the Old Testament. He was able to reconcile the Old Testament with the New Testament very thoroughly. That is the one thing that the Pharisees were having a great trouble doing. They saw the New Testament as against the Old Testament. They saw Christ and all that he represented as something that is terribly against the Jewish beliefs. And Paul was able to bring it together. Paul was able to see the meaning of what the Old Testament taught. He was able to see that the Old Testament was teaching the very same thing the New Testament is now saying. He saw that the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. It is about him, Jesus, that the Old Testament talked about. Every sacrifice, everything that happened in the Old Testament represented this Christ and his work of salvation. He was able to do that. So his expertise in the Jewish teachings helped him to fight against the onslaught 
of Judaism against Christianity. Otherwise, the Jews would have come against Christianity so strongly and drowned it completely. But he was able to stand against it. God had prepared a special man for it. Secondly, this great apostle was called to become the apostle to the Gentiles, and he did that very effectively. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, that he has become all things to all men, so that by all means he might save some. He says in Romans itself, in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, that he is a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, the wise and the unwise. He's a debtor. He wants to preach the gospel. That is why. To everyone, to the Greek, the barbarians, the wise, the unwise, and so on. So God was preparing this man to accommodate the Gentiles, to accept the Gentiles. He had a mentality that went beyond the restrictions of Judaism. He was a man who was brilliant, able to understand, who was able to relate the gospel to every culture and to every person. He was able to take the gospel to the whole world. It's amazing how God prepared this man. He's been preparing him all this time for this task. Now, what have we learned from this? Now, we learned something very important about the relationship between the Holy Spirit and his work on the one hand and natural abilities on the other hand. We just now talked about how God gave him natural abilities and in the natural, the background that enabled Paul to be raised up as a man who was able to do the two tasks that God had called him to do. That is, he was filled with great intelligence. God had given him extraordinary intelligence, born as a Jew, raised in the Greek culture, and he had Roman citizenship. All of this are natural equipment that he was endowed with. Now, a lot of people say, well, all of that is not necessary. You need to understand the relationship between Holy Spirit and his work and natural abilities. Some people completely dismiss natural abilities. They say, what is natural abilities? Who needs natural abilities? All you need to have is to be born again and to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the gifts of the Holy Spirit and you can take the gospel everywhere. Natural abilities count for nothing, they say. <laughs> is that so? <laughs> they say only the Holy Spirit and his anointing is necessary. Natural gifts do not matter. For a man who is filled with the Spirit, natural abilities or natural gifts do not matter. Natural abilities means his upbringing, his education, his knowledge don't matter as long as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, they say. Now, I've heard this all through my life. And they use some Bible verses for that. For example, the verse that is there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God has chosen the foolish things. So people with no natural abilities to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things, people that don't know, that don't have natural abilities, again, to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So God always chooses the nothings in the world to do something. God takes a person who's nothing and does great things. Now, I'm a great believer in that. I believe and I've seen in experience in all the years of my ministry, I've seen that God can choose anybody and do anything. God is mighty God. In the Bible you read, he even used a donkey, you know. If he can use a donkey, I'm sure he can use any man. No matter how unintelligent he is and no matter how he does not have any natural abilities, God can still take him and use him, make him his instrument. I have no doubt about that. But I do not believe that 
natural abilities are something that God himself rejects. People take these kinds of verses. They also take another verse, for example, chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians and verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They say the natural man, no matter how intelligent he is, he cannot understand the things of God. What's the use then of education, of training and all of those things? Natural abilities do not matter, they say. And then they go to 2 Corinthians and go to chapter 10 and verse 4 and 5 and refer to that where it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing in every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So they say, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal weapons. The education is a carnal weapon. Natural ability is a carnal weapon. Expertise in something is carnal weapon. Training is a carnal weapon. Giftedness, natural giftedness is a carnal weapon. But God has endowed us with mighty weapons, spiritual weapons to break down the strongholds and uh, destroy the arguments that are presented, they say. So they use all these verses. I just gave you three different verses. They say it doesn't matter then what people's gifts are. Whether he's learned or ignorant, doesn't matter. Nothing matters but the power of the Holy Spirit, they say. In other words, I would even go as far as saying, in my own experience, I've seen this, that people in the past, particularly in India here, in the kind of background that I come from, they believed that not having any natural abilities, not having any education, not having any training, not having any natural abilities, they believed is a qualification. <laughs> if you don't have any natural abilities, natural powers, not gifted in any way, if you're totally a useless person naturally, then that's the qualification they thought. <laughs> if you don't have any learning, any training, any great natural powers, that's a qualification. That means you're called to ministry. That's the way a lot of people thought. So they'll say things like, I'm not very clever, but I'm anointed. I don't know why a person cannot be clever and anointed, you know. They think if you're anointed, you shouldn't be clever. Only person who's not clever can be anointed, you know, that kind of a thing. So they took pride in not having any natural abilities. But it's a fallacy. It's wrong. The Bible itself shows it's wrong. Look how God prepared Moses. If God left him to be raised among the Jews, he would not have been able to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Because the Jewish people for more than 300 years were in slavery. For the first 70 years was good, but after that they were in slavery. And some 430 years later, God wants to bring them out of Egypt. He would have had a lot of trouble because not one man would be qualified enough or not one man will have the boldness to go and present himself before Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. That is why God took Moses as soon as he was born. He didn't give him a chance to be raised in the Jewish home. As soon as he was born, he was taken and by divine ordination, by divine will, he was taken into Pharaoh's home and was raised there. And the Bible says he was learned in all of the skills of the Egyptians. He learned in an Egyptian university. Raised as a king's kid so that he will have the qualification, the training, the boldness, the confidence needed to do a great work, to be the deliverer of three million people, 30 lakhs of people. Not a very easy thing. It was an extraordinary man to be able to lead those people because he was quite well educated and trained in Pharaoh's house and God gave him that. 
God gave him that training so that he can do it. Even David, before he met Goliath, God gave him some training by going against the bear and the lion, you know, so that when he came against Goliath, he knew that he can do it. Gives him confidence. Look at Isaiah, read his book, observe his language. Tremendous language. If you read the book of Isaiah, closing your eyes, you'll know that it's Isaiah. You cannot mistake it for any other book. Such superior language. Jeremiah was trained as a priest and so on. In the New Testament, we have Paul, so well trained. John, for example, sometimes we never think of John. Read John's gospel, a very special gospel among the four gospels. Amazing gospel. And read John's epistles, the kind of concepts he talks about. And his logic and his arguments are amazing. So in the history of the church and throughout the centuries, you see that God chooses and trains people for the task. Even Augustine that we talked about, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, all of these great men of God were people that were so well trained, so well educated, They were preachers, you see, but came from a very strong training and background. Raised up, you know, Jonathan Edwards, for example, brought about the great awakening in America. He's a preacher, became the president of the Princeton University. You know, not an ordinary man. God raised them up like that. God gave them natural, unusual abilities and gifts. And God used those gifts and abilities to bring his purposes to pass. So we can say two, three things about natural gifts versus the Holy Spirit and his work. How do we understand the Holy Spirit and his work and natural gifts? How do we look at these two things together? How do we bring the two together? One, you must first understand there is nothing wrong in and of itself in natural gifts. Because it is God who gives these gifts to men. God gives these gifts to men. A man does not create his own gifts. Shakespeare didn't create his own gifts. All gifts are given by God. And therefore it's wrong to speak against natural gifts and giftings. The Christian faith puts no premium on ignorance or dullness. As Christians, we should not praise ignorance or dullness, you know. It puts no premium on ignorance and dullness. It doesn't condemn intelligence. It doesn't condemn learning. It doesn't condemn natural gifts. So there is nothing wrong with natural gifts. In and of themselves, there's nothing wrong. Secondly, what becomes wrong is when natural gifts are relied upon and they are gloried in. That is when it goes wrong. Not wrong to have natural gifts because God gives them. But when you begin to rely upon it in such a way that you think you got natural gifts, therefore you don't have any need for the Holy Spirit. You become so confident of your natural gift and you say, I don't need the Holy Spirit. Now that is where the trouble comes in. That's where it's wrong. You cannot rely upon it. You cannot glory in it. This is the thing that Paul was concerned about when he wrote to the Corinthians because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in that passage that I had just read to you about how God chooses the foolish things of the world to put to shame, the wise and so on. After that verse 28, verse 29, the very next verse says that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why he says that. He's not condemning intelligence. He's not condemning person being bright or gifted or anything like that. He's not saying natural gifts are of no use. He says, no one should glory in his presence. No one should glory in his presence. When you glory in it, that defeats the purpose. Thirdly, God does not come in and give you the Holy Spirit so that natural gifts are set aside are put away or done away. (laughs) Doesn't mean that because God has given you the power of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that God wants to get rid of the natural gifts. 
God wants to do away with, the, with all your learning and education and all of those things. I've even seen people tear up their degrees, you know, thinking that it's useless, you know. I reject this natural gift. I consider them, you know, as useless, they say. <laughs> I've seen people tear up degrees and throw them in the garbage because they've now become so spiritual, so anointed, so full of the power. They don't need natural gifts. But the thing is, God gave them that. God gave them the mind to study well. God gave them the brilliance of mind. God gave them the ability, the gifts, and so on. We saw how God chose men and trained men and used them. Everyone has their own style, even in the writing of the Bible, you know, written by 40 different authors at different times in history. Spirit-guided writing. It is not a dictation. What you see here is not dictation. Everything doesn't look exactly the same. You can read Paul, closing your eyes, you can tell it's Paul. You can tell the difference between Paul and John in their writing, or Paul and Peter in their writing. Similarly with Isaiah and others, you know. You can say where it comes from. If you've read the Bible, you know that their individual styles are retained. You can see their background and their brilliance coming out through the writing of God's word. They inspired God's word. God didn't get rid of natural gifts. God uses those natural gifts, their style and their abilities in order to bring about his word. So the word of God is not mechanical dictation so that everything sounds from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, everything is the same. No. Each one has their own style and you can see that throughout the scriptures. Now, as we go through the epistle to the Romans, we'll see all that. We'll be impressed here by the order, the logic, the argument, the profundity, the deep emotion, the energy of the spirit with which Paul writes. You can see that. All these gifts this apostle has or had was taken possession by the Holy Spirit and that displayed magnificently in this epistle. It's God who gives men these gifts. It's God who saw to it that it was, saw to it that he was born and raised in Tarsus, born as a Jew, had Roman citizenship, had training under Gamaliel. Gamaliel. All that God saw to it. You see, do you see the glory of God shining through all this? God preparing the right man for the right job, to do the right task in the right way, in the best way, in the most amazing way God gets a man prepared and ready. God bless you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the word. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. Help us to see the glory of God through all of this. Help us to see ourselves how we are in your hands, how you have formed us and shaped us even from our mother's womb, how you have a great purpose for us, that you work in our hearts, you work in our lives, even before we ever come to know you, you are at work preparing us for the task ahead. Help us to see that, O oh God, and appreciate it. Help us to see the glory of God, the greatness of God, and how he does things. We praise you and worship you more and more as we realize these things, O oh God. We give you all glory in Jesus' name. Amen.